Dave, welcome back to the podcast. How are you doing today? Jesse, this is the fourth time I've been on your show. How can I not be good? We love having you on the show. Always an entertaining, information-packed, inspirational conversation. And I got to say, I've read all your books except for one. I think you have one called Superhuman, right? Yep. That's the that's anti-aging the book. Okay. That's the one I haven't read. I've read everything else. But of all the books I've read, this one is my favorite. Oh, thanks, man. I, that, that means a lot. You've got an early review copy. I think it's my best book. And what I love about it, it's actually surprising because you are such a hacker, biohacker, and you're such an extreme person. But this book's looking at fasting, and you actually have not a gentle approach. You have an approach out there for everybody. But your basic approach you're recommending to people is rather gentle, and you're very forgiving. So talk about you know where that comes from. Well, having having weighed 300 pounds and gone through this time in my life where like I'm doing everything that I think is supposed to work and I feel like I have the accelerator all the way to the floor and I'm slowing down and you can push harder, but there's nowhere else for the pedal to go. And well, that was before I had kids. And, and so I, I look at all these kind of, you know, keto bros and, you know, fasting purists and a lot of them don't have a lot going on in their life. <laughs> and when you want to tell someone who's already full, you're busy, you're, you're working hard. Now you've got, you know, kids running around the house and you're trying to work and you're trying to exercise and do all the things that you're supposed to be doing. Um, taking a, a rigid approach uh, to fasting doesn't actually work. And if you're saying, oh, I'm going to do this, that's going to make me so healthy. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to function all morning <laughs> or for a whole day in my life because I want to do this thing to make my life better. It's actually counterproductive. So I'm like, how does someone who was like me, you know, overweight with great intentions doing their best, how do they get started on fasting? Because, oh, just drink only water for three days. You'll be fine. You actually won't be fine. You'll be hypoglybitchy. You'll yell at your kids. Uh, you'll do stuff you wish you didn't do in your job. And you'll want to pay attention and you'll have no brain. And this is the reality of, of real fasting. True fasting, when you're doing longer periods and you're having nothing at all, it comes with rest. They go together. And we are not resting, but we want the benefits of fasting. So this aspect of, well, I wanted this, but I didn't want to give up this. How do I make it work? And it turns out we know enough about biology that you can do it. So this is meant for people, whether you're an advanced faster, there's stuff in here, but whether someone is, look, I've never tried intermittent fasting. Or I tried it once and it sucked because I got really angry at 1130 and I was tired and cold and I didn't like my life. How could I possibly do this several days a week for the next while to get the benefits? The answer is you won't because life gets in the way. So this is how to fast and do everything else and use the fasting as a way to get more energy instead of get less energy. Well, let's take it right from the top here and talk about somebody who is brand new to fasting. What's a gentle approach for them to begin to, you know, start the practice? It, it would be really easy to write a fasting book. And it goes like this. Step one, don't eat for a while. Step two, here's a bunch of science from PubMed that says it's good for you. And, and this is kind of the template for fasting, but there's a lot between those things. And I didn't want to write that book at all uh, because it's already been written. They're actually really good books on the why of fasting. And there's enough of that in here that you see that it's of benefit, but okay, you're that first person and you're saying, okay, I know I'm not supposed to eat, except they never talk about what you're not supposed to eat. The real definition of fasting is going without. And you can choose what you go without. If you're on the keto diet, you're fasting from carbs. If you're on a vegan diet for some uh, non-health reason, uh, then you might be doing it for health reasons. It just doesn't work. But you can be a vegan and you're saying, okay, I'm fasting from animal foods. And you say, I'm not going to have alcohol. You're fasting from alcohol. So there's many types of fasts, even things like you know cold therapy. I'm going to fast from being warm for a little while to make myself stronger. Like There's just all sorts of things. Every one of those, the commonality is, the body thinks you'll die if you take a cold shower. And it tells you, that's pain, run away. But then you do it for three days, like, oh, I feel better. And then the body thinks you'll die if you don't eat one of the six meals a day you have to eat so you don't go into starvation mode. So the way you get started with fasting is just recognize that the body is going to send you a false signal, right? And there's something called hunger which most people don't experience regularly. And there's something called cravings, which most people experience regularly. And 
So what's going to happen is you'll get a message and you might even say to yourself, wow, I'm starving right now. It takes two or three months to starve. <laughs> that is the absolute real reality. But it feels like you're starving right now. So one approach and the approach that's most often visualized for fasting is, hey, you're just going to have to man up and just suck it up and, and walk it off and just, just kind of ignore that. There's just one problem. It takes willpower and energy to do that right at a time where you're doing a practice that reduces the available energy for you. So to rely on willpower when you just turn the power knob down is kind of a bad strategy. You might win some of the time, but the rest of the time, the donut sitting there at 10 a.m. is going to win. And then you're going to go, God, why am I so weak? Why did I do that? Now, I'm saying this from experience, being a 300-pound person who swore I was going to eat the cookie. And there's this inner dialogue that goes through. And you convince yourself, you know what? It's a good idea to have just half the cookie. And like, there's some reason. And since you eat it, you're like, God, why did I do that? So the first thing for someone who's brand new to fasting, okay, here's what you're going to do. Have dinner a little bit earlier than normal. Um, you'll sleep better anyway. Don't have any snacks after dinner. And let's say you can do that three or four hours before bedtime. You just fasted for four hours. You sleep for, let's say, seven, eight hours. You got 12 hours of fasting. That's the very entry level, <laughs> right? It wasn't that hard. But now let's say, okay, I'm going to make it until lunchtime. So there's another four hours. You just did a 16-hour fast if you just wait till lunch. But the odds are that morning, if you have weight to lose like I did, um, or even if you don't have weight to lose, but you know your metabolism, is, metabolism isn't that healthy, what do you do? And in Fast This Way, I present three fasting hacks, one of which has never been written about in the world of fasting. And it comes from not a purist point of view uh, that says you can only have water during a fast. It comes from what are the benefits of fasting, what stops the benefits, and what are the things I want to feel while I'm fasting. And what I want to feel while I'm fasting is no thoughts about hunger, <laughs> and I want to feel no lack of energy, and I still want all the benefits of fasting. So how do you create that endpoint? So the cost of fasting is very low in terms of your energy, but the benefits are as high or nearly as high as if you just did water only and just decided you were going to suck it up. So it's that approach that works for everyone. And suddenly you're like, wait, you mean I saved time on breakfast? I saved money on breakfast. I didn't suffer as a result. I think I can do this. And so the first one is, okay, we'll have dinner a little early. And so you, you can get the fast in and still have normal meal times at noon and at dinner. This, the other three big fasting hacks in the book, the first one is have a cup of black coffee in the morning. And the reason for this is really fascinating. It turns out there's two hunger hormones that control way more of your thought process than you think. And one of them is called ghrelin. Ghrelin's the hunger hormone. It turns on hunger and desire for food. And the one that makes you feel full and sated is CCK or cholecystokinin. And if you can bump your ketone levels up just a little bit, magically, and these are there are studies that show this, this is way less than full-on keto mode, but just a little bump in ketones will turn down ghrelin and turn up CCK. So the voice in your head screaming at you to eat the muffin or whatever, it just shuts up. Okay, and that is liberating. The reason coffee works is that coffee has uh, the ability to double ketone production. This is the amount of caffeine in two small cups of coffee, so it doesn't take a lot. Like you know, medium or large coffee is gonna is gonna do just fine. And it's also shown that caffeine is a mild, mild appetite suppressant. So now you've got more energy because you had caffeine. And coffee, by the way, is shown in so many studies to be good for you. Like Google the name of your favorite disease in coffee and look at the science. Like it's, it's the best superfood there is. And people say it's addictive. I don't know. If there was something you did every day and when you stop doing it, you feel bad, um, you'd be addicted, right? I'm talking about exercise. <laughs> so, in fact, coffee is as important as exercise in my book. So... And if you don't like coffee, you can use tea, but you just need to get something like matcha, like a strong tea. And when you do that, it's going to suppress that appetite. It's going to give you energy. For beginning fasters, that oftentimes isn't enough. And then you go to the second fasting hack, one I'm very well known for, and I'm not here to sell this. Many, many people have tried Bulletproof Coffee, but it works during a fast. And I've been writing about this for 10 years 
And people have bought about half a million copies of my books. People have lost more than a million pounds on the Bulletproof Diet. At this point, it is very safe to say that this works. I've also talked to several experts in autophagy, this idea of when you fast, your body breaks down old, weak cells and waste products and gets rid of them. Drinking Bulletproof coffee with only specific fats in it, no protein, no carbs of any form, it allows your body to stay in a fasting mode because your insulin doesn't change and because your protein digestion doesn't get turned on. So what you do is you take a little bit of butter. It can be a lot if you're starving or you're really big, but it only needs to be a teaspoon. And you take some C8 MCT oil. The Bulletproof brand is Brain Octane. I'm the guy who made MCT oil famous. And you blend that in there. And several things happen with Bulletproof coffee. One is when you blend the butter into the coffee itself, it changes the structure of the water in the coffee. This is not like quantum crystal structure. This is University of Washington research by Gerald Pollack. I wrote a blank check, or not a blank check, but a check without a specific protocol in mind. Said, here's $50,000, discover something about water. And Gerald went out and he said, well, I know that water in the body changes. The, the body actually, when you drink a cup of water, it changes by heating up water when it's near a cell membrane. Cell membranes are little droplets of fat. And once the water changes, and when I say changes, you can see it on a microscope. This is not magic water. This is, oh, look, there's a little blurry edge there. What's that? It's called exclusion zone water. Well, he found that droplets of butter fat in water <laughs> create the largest exclusion zone he's ever seen. So when you blend it, and you have to blend your Bulletproof coffee, and it's already heated, you're changing the structure of the water. And this matters during fasting, because normally when you drink a cup of water, you have to heat the water up, which means burning some energy. And then you can use the water to fold proteins and to make more energy. But since you've already structured the water, you drink it, the body's like, oh, great, I'll just go straight to work on fast burning. I don't have to do that on fat burning. I don't have to do that first heating step. So you don't get cold and you don't have a dip in energy. That's why the Tibetans drink their yak butter tea, which was the inspiration for Bulletproof Coffee. We didn't know this. This is new science. hasn't even been published yet. Um, and uh, I saw the preprint of the publication uh, from Dr. Pollock a couple of years after I made the donation to the university. So that's a part of it. But then the MCT oil, it raises, at least the C8 MCT, it raises ketones four times more than coconut oil or the cheapest, most abundant MCT oil. So the type of MCT you get really matters because the C12 or lauric acid, that doesn't do anything special different than corn oil for raising ketones. And coconut oil, if you have a tablespoon of that, it's the same as fasting for eight hours. But if you have the C8 MCT, you get four times more ketones. So what you've done now in that little cup of coffee that was creamy and delicious, you didn't damage your fast. You gave yourself water you can immediately use to generate ATP and burn more fat. And you gave yourself ketones, which trains your cells to become fat burning machines. And if you do this on a regular basis, all of the cells in your body are like, oh, I can always burn fat or I can burn carbohydrates or protein or whatever. But it's a very different thing and it's pretty cool. So let me just jump in here real quick, Dave. So you're saying for somebody who's a total newbie, you you said a few different things here. You said cutting dinner, stopping eating after dinner and maybe eating a little bit earlier uh, and then going to bed. Yep. Number two, having coffee. And then number three is having the Bulletproof coffee. So for the newbie, by what you're explaining here, it sounds like the Bulletproof coffee is going to be the easiest way to begin fasting. So do what you said in step one, eat a little earlier, don't eat in the morning, have a Bulletproof coffee. And and we got to get to step three, though. Talk about what the third the third aspect is there. So if you just do those two, most people, they sail through a fast and the most magic thing happens. 10 a.m. comes around, 10.30, when everyone is having their morning snack and going to the vending machine or, you know, the, the pastries and whatever, you look at it and instead of doing what I would always do, which is, okay, I'm just going to take a deep breath. Maybe I'll have a, some beef jerky. I, like, I'm going to look away. You just look at it like, I don't want it. <laughs> the, the freedom of just not desiring junk food is really big the first time you feel it. I, I know that Bulletproof Coffee does that just from hundreds of thousands of people. And then the final thing, which is new to the world of fasting and really belongs here, is called prebiotic fiber. And I wrote about that in Superhuman, the book that you haven't read, because getting soluble fiber that you can't digest, but that your good gut bacteria eat, it is shown in hundreds of studies to make you live longer. 
And it also causes you to grow a lot more species of good gut bacteria. So when bacteria eat prebiotic fiber, they make short chain fatty acids that are ketogenic. So what that means is you put a scoop or two of prebiotic fiber in, and now you have a drink that has no digestible carbohydrates. So it doesn't raise your blood sugar at all. It doesn't have any protein, so it's not causing your liver to start making enzymes for digestion. Those enzymes can go to fixing your body. And soluble fiber like that, or prebiotic fiber, it dramatically lowers hunger. So if you put that in there, there is no one on earth <laughs> with that combination. You drink that, you're going to be hungry afterwards. So now all of a sudden, like, wait a minute, I get the benefits of fasting, and I just don't care about food. And the first day you do this, here's the benefit that is amazing. I found a study in Fast This Way that shows that for the average person, this doesn't mean the average obese person, it's just the average person, 15% of the thoughts in their head every day are about what's for my next meal. When you turn down ghrelin and you turn up CCK, you get 15% of the thoughts in your head back. Because when noon comes around and all your colleagues get up to go to lunch or you know, the kids come in pesty or whatever the, the deal is now that you're probably working from home, um, you look go, oh, I guess I could eat. Okay, those are words I have never said in my life when I was obese because it was like, okay, I got 15 more minutes and then it's taco time and then like you're really focused on it. So you get that focus back. Right, So those are the big three fasting hacks from Fast This Way. And there's a lot about the mental and, and cognitive and the different things for men and women. There's a chapter for women. But if you just get started with that, a slightly earlier dinner, and if you fail on that, that's okay. Just wake up, replace breakfast with either black coffee, bulletproof coffee, or bulletproof coffee with soluble fiber or prebiotic fiber. The brand that I make is called Inner Fuel for Bulletproof. You don't have to buy any of my Bulletproof stuff. It just works better because I designed it that way. So I'm not here to sell you. It will not change my life if every listener buys Bulletproof or doesn't. I just made it because I thought it needed to be made and that it matters. Um, the primary ingredients in the soluble prebiotic fiber are, are basically sap from trees that feed the good guys in your gut. There's acacia gum, there's guar gum that's hydrolyzed, there's larch herbenogalactin and other ingredients like that. But I looked at the most studied ones and I put them together. And all that's, you know, bulletproof inner fuel, bulletproof brain octane is the C8 oil and the bulletproof coffee beans don't have toxins in them. And I will warn you, if you drink a cup of cheap black coffee, even if it's from a you know major chain, in the US, we don't have any laws about the mold toxin level in coffee. So when it's illegal to sell coffee in China, Japan, or Europe, they will send it to the US and we'll drink it. So if you drink a cup of coffee and then you get a, a severe sugar craving, you have to pee, but your bladder's not full and you feel like you wanna punch someone, it wasn't the coffee. It was the stuff that grew on the coffee while it was being processed. And if that happens, some of the supplements I talk about that you can take during a fast may help you. But drinking coffee that makes you hungry is, not, is a bad idea. So if you notice that, switch to a different coffee. So one thing I noticed reading the new book, something I hadn't heard you talk about before was this soluble fiber, adding that into a bulletproof coffee. And you've, you've broken down what that is. And, and it's not a product I've tried, but I'm, I'm now curious. I'm going to have to give it a whirl. But does it change the taste of the coffee at all? Or does it does it add something granular in there? So when you're sipping your coffee, you know, it's not not the same? Most people are used to like a metamucil sawdust kind of fiber. When you think about fiber, like blah. Now those are bulk fibers, different animal. What we're talking about here is something that dissolves into the water. It has an extremely neutral taste. Most people can't tell it's in coffee. It, it might have a, I mean, if you're a super taster, you might find like a very slight shift, but it still tastes like a latte. And, and that's important to me. Like, you don't want to ruin your coffee. You want the flavor of the coffee to come through. So butter is the same fat as milk. Uh, in fact, everyone who's tried Bulletproof Coffee made properly is like, oh, this is surprisingly delicious. Like, like I, I like this. When you add inner fuel, you usually, if you give it to someone, they can't tell it's in there. And now the FDA recommends, I think, 20 or 30 grams of soluble fiber um, every day. Uh, for longevity, for health. The FDA has always said at minimum to not die of deficiency. I now, after writing Superhuman and measuring my gut bacteria, I have the number of species of gut bacteria present that a much younger person has. As you age, you have less species in your gut. 
And I was able to quadruple the number of species because I started adding that to my Bulletproof coffee. You can also add it to any meal to make yourself full. And this is another thing that's important. If you eat a dinner that has stuff that triggers cravings in it, when you wake up the next morning, the first thought in your mind will be food. And you'll have that kind of like a crampy feeling in your stomach. I got I to eat right now. That means you ate something that wasn't compatible with you. But when you add a scoop of this uh, prebiotic fiber to whatever kind of to your salad dressing, to whatever sauce, it just disappears. You can't tell it's in there. And you can pour some brain octane on there as well, which raises ketones. Most people sleep better when they do that because they're more satiated. And during a fast, obviously, we're not going to have any food in our system, any glucose, any sugar. But I'm just curious, kind of as a side note, when you use the brain octane and you do have carbohydrates in your system, do you still produce ketones? 100%. Brain octane is the best selling source of exogenous ketones. It comes into the body and in one step, the body converts it into beta hydroxybutyrate, whether or not you just ate a cheesecake. And if you take something like a ketone salt or a ketone ester, both of those require one step of conversion. Um, if it's a salt, your kidneys have to pull out all the metals um, that are bound to the BHB. And if it's an ester, your liver has to do the work. But brain octane is the most natural form. It's found in mother's milk, and it doesn't create the load on the liver or the load on the kidneys that come from other sources of exogenous ketones. That's one of the reasons that I don't sell other forms of ketones uh, at Bulletproof, just because uh, I was ready to start selling a ketone salt, which is a way to, to dramatically raise ketones. But a guy who studied with Hans Krebs, who spent 40 years studying ketosis, uh, I was the last guy to interview him um, before he passed, straight up said, in my laboratory, I am 100% convinced that ketone salts cause mitochondrial damage. So I pulled the product before I shipped it. Wow. When was that? Oh, maybe four years ago, I'm guessing. I'd have, I have a poor sense of time in the past, but his name is Dr. Veach. He was a fan of esters, but there's a whole nother uh, group of research that shows that deesterification creates a heavy load on the liver. So if you wanted to source a way to raise your ketones every single day without pushing liver or kidneys beyond what you want them to do every day, Brain Octane is the only game in town, as far as I can tell. And I'd be very happy to make those other products. In fact, I synthesized ketone esters. It was $40,000 to make a kilo of them way back in 2013. And I just was like, nah, I don't think it's the right path. So there, there's, there's debate on this, to be perfectly honest, but there's a lot of MLM companies pushing ketone salts. When you're fasting for long periods of time, your ketone levels tend to go up and up and up as your body starts burning more fat. But the trick is when you first start fasting, if you're not used to this and you haven't already tried keto and things like that, your cells don't know how to burn fat. You have these little, the mitochondria, it's easiest to call them power plants. They're actually environmental sensors that make energy, hormones, and other chemicals that control your body. They're sort of the puppet masters. They're configured to only eat sugar and a little bit of protein. And if you have ketones present over time, they're like, oh, I guess I should reconfigure myself so that I can also burn fat. And now you have metabolic flexibility. And if you go like, keto, bro, I'm never eating a carb again, then they stop having their ability to burn sugar, which is not a good idea. At least they turn it way down. So what I want is cells that can just as easily eat fat as eat carbohydrates. And when you do that, you have a much more resilient metabolism and you're likely to live longer as a result. And you talk about in the book what that would look like is maybe fasting during the week, doing intermittent fasting. And then Saturday and Sunday, having like a gluten-free waffle with the family. And that's kind of how I operate. I do intermittent fasting throughout the week. And then on weekends, I'm, I'm open to going out for a nice healthy brunch or making a gluten-free pancake with the family at home. And I find that works really well. Um, so again, I, I just want to hammer home the point you're making there about you don't want to just run on fat. You want to be able to run on fat and then be able to switch and run on sugar too. And that's, that's the sweet spot. Yeah. There's something that that's in the book. Uh, I call it the fasting trap, but it's I, it's a human condition. There's a vegan trap that I fell into. There's a keto trap that I've definitely experienced. <laughs> and uh, then there's the fasting trap. And these traps all work the same way. And it goes like this. Actually, there's also an exercise trap now that I think about it. I am going to take on a new behavior that I have convinced myself is going to make positive changes. I do the behavior and I see the changes. So when I was a raw vegan, I'm like, wow, okay, I'm, I'm really, I'm getting a ton of energy. Now, I didn't understand why I was getting energy. It wasn't for a good reason. But, um, and then same thing with keto. I feel so good. Same thing with intermittent fasting. 
I am never eating breakfast again. I feel so much better. I'm like, my focus is better. I mean, people are, are so amazed at, at how much better they feel by not having breakfast. But then after about four to six weeks, you are 100% convinced this is the way. Why would I ever go back to the crappy thing I did before? But then something starts to go wrong because the body doesn't like a steady state. It, it likes cycles and it likes being able to switch in and out. So after four to six weeks, something isn't quite right. And you go, oh, it's probably because I'm keto, but I ate you know, 18 grams of carbs. I'm going to go down to 12 grams of carbs. I'm going to be even more keto, right? And then it still isn't working and you're plateaued and you've lost 50 of the 100 pounds. By the way, that happened to me in the 90s. I, I tried the Atkins diet. Couldn't lose the second 50, but the first 50 sure did come off fast. So you end up going deeper and deeper following a path that you know works, even though it's no longer working. And then if you do the vegan thing, same thing. Like, why am I cold all the time? Why am I getting autoimmunity? You know, why is my bone density going down? Why do my teeth hurt? All that stuff. Well, it's because you did it for too long. And with fasting, what I find is regularly, and this is based on 10 years of interacting with people on the Bulletproof diet, people doing Bulletproof intermittent fasting. And women hit the wall first. And what it looks like when a woman doesn't break their fasts or break her fasts, um, often enough and and it just says okay first i started skipping breakfast now i'm going down to one meal a day i'm just going to have dinner because i feel so good i'm losing weight like i i'm liberated i love my brain well the first thing that happens is they wake up in the morning and go i feel like i didn't sleep very well like i kind of feel a bit hungover i wonder what's going on here and then weird i have relatively normal cycles but it's not working right this month and then you get hair thinning and the answer for that is going to sound really straightforward. Have some breakfast already and have some carbs, right? <laughs> you do not have to be in keto to do what I talk about in Fast This Way. Um, it, it's totally optional. You can have carbs every night if you want to. And this is about timing and type of food. And when you do this, um, especially as a woman, if you have weight to lose and you want to do this for long term, it really helps to start out doing it three or four days a week. So maybe Wednesday, you know, I'm going to have breakfast, but I'm not going to have cereal. I'm going to have protein and I'm going to have fat for breakfast and I'm going to have my carbs at dinner. And that helps you with sleep. And that also lets the body know, oh, I'm in an area where there is enough food, right? So sometimes I go without, sometimes I go with. But if you convince those little sensors in your body, they're not very smart, they're bacteria. <laughs> so you convince them that, okay, I'm in a land where there really is enough food because I never get to eat except maybe once a day. They start turning on cellular stressors like cortisol and adrenaline. And you wake up at three in the morning and you have racing thoughts and you wonder what's going on. All of that's hackable. And the answer is have some breakfast already or have some carbs. So for women who want to do this sustainably, start out with three or four days a week do the fasting hacks and fast this way because they at least give you energy availability, even if it's not carbohydrates. And that tends to avoid the wall. The wall for men, when you over fast, saying, okay, I'm just doing one meal a day forever. Or maybe, you know, every week I'll do a, a 48 hour fast and a bunch of 24 hour fasts. And it's really common. People are like, I feel so good. I, I, my, I had to buy new pants. Like, this is it. Well, what happens first is sleep quality goes down. You and when I did this back when I was testing the limits of the Bulletproof Diet uh, back in like 2010, 2011, uh, before I first published it, I did three months of one serving of broccoli a day. I mean, I was very, very low carb. And what happened was my sleep monitoring stuff showed that I was waking up 12 times a night without knowing it. And I would wake up in the morning feeling like I didn't sleep. And then predictably for men, and this usually starts at six to eight weeks, not at the, the four to six weeks for women, you wake up and you don't have the normal morning kickstand that uh, most guys have in the morning. And then, so sleep quality goes down, hormone changes, and then hair thinning. So you don't have, just because it's good doesn't mean more is better. When I weighed 300 pounds, I said, oh, I'm going to work out because I know that's going to you know, burn extra calories. By the way, that doesn't work at all. <laughs> but uh, working out is like 10% of how you look. But what I... What I found was that after 18 months of working out six days a week, 90 minutes per session, half weights, half cardio, you know, wearing a weighted vest, walking on the treadmill at an angle and all that kind of stuff, um, I was overtrained and I still weighed 300 pounds. So you can say exercise is good, but I will tell you heavy exercise every day will wreck your life. 
right? And some people, especially if you're very young, you're like, well, Dave, I, I can handle a vegan diet. I can handle exercise every day. I mean, you can also handle a life of pizza and beer and staying out until two every morning. It's because you have a lot of energy when you're young, but you're burning it up and you actually want to, you want to conserve that for all of your life. And this is part of the wisdom of fasting that says the right dose is very helpful. The wrong dose of too much is no better than too little. So we want to be in the Goldilocks zone for exercise. We want to be there for all of the things that we do in life. And even things like cortisol, the stress hormone, it's bad. You should have no cortisol. People with low cortisol hate their lives because they get sick all the time. <laughs> right? So you need cortisol. You just don't need too much or too little. So all of these are about setting up cycles and waves in your life where you go to the upper healthy limit and you go to the lower healthy limit and you tell the body, you better be strong enough to go within these normal limits. And then for brief periods of time, you go, we're going to blow the limit out. And then the body goes, oh my God, I might have to survive in a world where there's no food for all of 24 hours. And then it takes a hard look at itself. This is all automated systems and goes, which parts of me can't do that? Oh, this tiny fraction of cells, they're the weak ones. I thought I could let them run because I didn't think they were weak. But now that I know the environment might have occasional food shortages, I'm just going to go out and execute, <laughs> remove all of these weak cells, and I'm going to grow fresh, young, strong ones. And that's that process of autophagy I talked about before. And it'll do it for the power plants, the mitochondria in the cells, and it'll do it for whole cells. And it's powerfully anti-aging to do this. But if instead you just go into straight up starvation mode, it doesn't work. In starvation mode, it's fine if you do a four-day fast. And under medical supervision, you can go 40, 50, up to 70 days if you really have a lot of weight to lose or you're dying of some kind of condition. Uh, but what you want to do here is just show the body that it's not regularly starving, but it could happen, so it better be ready. And those are the key words, better be ready, because that is the core definition of resilience. A resilient human can turn on masses of energy throughout the body in a second's notice at any time. And this is why the other practices that I mentioned in the book, like fasting from heat for brief periods, oh, you mean I might have to make all the cells in my body turn on heat rapidly? The ones that can't do that, those are the ones to target and upgrade. And, and same thing, oh, I might have to actually be able to function without food for 18 hours or 24 hours. Well, the cells that can't do that, they're clearly not suitable. Let's get better ones. And what you end up with is a brain that works way better whether or not you eat. And you end up with a metabolism that doesn't get massive blood sugar spikes when you do eat carbohydrates. You end up without diabetes. You end up with a much lower risk of cancer, heart disease. And what did it cost you to do this? Okay, you didn't have to suffer the way you thought a fast was gonna. Was, so there was no energy like, oh, I had to feel like crap every morning for a long time. No, that's not real, right? you didn't have to buy or make breakfast. You might use the fasting hacks, which are going to cost you a buck or two, but I guarantee it was cheaper and faster than what you do now for breakfast. All right. So you save money, you save time, you got more energy and you're going to live longer and you're not going to die suffering. And this is the highest ROI thing. That's why I wrote a book about it. It's so important. Well, Dave, throughout our chat here, you've talked about a number of the different benefits, the autophagy, and you just named off a bunch of different things, cancer and, and, heart health, and there, you've named a bunch of different stuff, but just to make sure we're all on the same page here, can you talk about any other major benefits people are going to get from fasting that we haven't talked about? Well, there are four things most likely to kill you if you just do the math, okay? And it's not COVID. <laughs> it is, number one is diabetes. You look at the number of people who are dying from diabetes or diabetes complications. Number two is cardiovascular disease. Number three is cancer. Number four is Alzheimer's. If you can dodge those four bullets, the quality of your life in the last 20 years will be very good because you'll know your own name. There'll be no tubes, no wheelchairs, and no diapers. Okay. Like people think of getting old. That's the picture they have now, which is a completely distorted picture of reality. The real way healthy people get old is you actually develop wisdom, <laughs> you finally dealt with all of your crap, and you have enough energy to help other people with the wisdom that you've accumulated. So we need our village elders back, and we need them to be healthy and high-powered. And the people who practice intermittent fasting now, however old they are, whether they're starting in their 60s or 70s, and there's tons of people doing that, or whether they're starting as you know 18-year-olds and saying, I'm going to do this, they are the ones who are going to be shining balls of energy and wisdom when they're 80 and 90 and 100. 
And because the cost of this is less than having breakfast and the energy you have is more than when you had breakfast, this is a sustainable practice for decades because it actually works better and it's pleasant. Well, I think a big part of it too is you can talk to people about all the different benefits they're going to have later in life, but it's easy enough for any of us to say, you know, that won't happen to me or I'm doing this, this, and this. I'm going to be healthy when I get older. But the great thing about fasting is you get the benefits in the moment, the energy, the mental alertness, and you're getting those other benefits that are going to be, you know, preventing all those diseases down the line as well. In fact, can we talk about the the F words from the book? Sure. Let's get into them. All right. This is something that came to me after I wrote uh, Headstrong. My This was my like monthly science bestseller list. One of the proudest moments in my life was Homo Deus and Sapiens are some of my favorite books. And Headstrong was sandwiched between those on the monthly science book. Best. And I was like, I'm so honored <laughs> as a as a reasonable author. Um, that, that was, to me, a, a major honor. In that book, I talk in detail about exactly um, what where you were just going with that, just about all of the different benefits of what happens in your brain. And it happens because of mitochondria. And after I published the book, I finally kind of woke up from a, a dream. I'm like, oh, I've got it. My undergrad degree is in a form of artificial intelligence. Um, we called it decision support systems back when I studied, and I studied information systems. And I spent the first half of my career as a computer hacker, figuring out how to manage millions of computers at the same time. It's a very similar mindset to managing what happens inside your body. So each little unit of energy production and monitoring these mitochondria, they have to follow the rules of life because they are bacteria that became a part of our system. So if you were to design something that was going to live forever as a species, it has to have some behaviors that are very easy to do and very simple because a little bacteria or a mold spore or a frog, there isn't a lot of mental processing capacity and it has to be inside a cell. So what we're seeing is tiny rules repeated forever. Here's the tiny rules that drive us and drive everything, everything alive, whether it's a plant or an animal. Number one, run away from, kill, or hide from scary things. You put 10 times more energy and focus on that, even if it just might kill you because you don't know. And if something kills a life form, then it can't reproduce the species, right? So that's fear. And it gets 10 times more focus. Your body will stop processing food and focus on using energy and looking around and being reactive. I mean, it'll steal your focus. The second F word that all life has to do to stay alive is eat everything. Because food or feeding, it, it's so important. Famines have killed everything that's ever been alive in much of history. So we know without having to think, we know in our bones eat the bagel. <laughs> because if you don't, the species could die. Okay, You know it's not true, but it doesn't matter because the feeling comes from the tissues. And then the next F word that all life forms would have to do is stay around forever. You read the book. You know what it is. Fertility. Ah, I love it that you didn't just go straight for a four-letter F word. So nice I job, know where Jeff. you're going. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's fertility. And that gets about three times more focus than it really needs. Um, in that we want to have love in our lives and we really do feel like if we're not having sex regularly as adults, like something's wrong, something's deeply wrong. And it's because our cells are telling us if you don't make babies, then the species will die. Now, all of those are untrue statements. Most of the time, what you're afraid of is not going to kill you. Okay. If it's a tiger, yes. But if it's your boss yelling at you, no, <laughs> right? Um, most of the time you feel like you're going to starve, but you have a couple months before you starve. It doesn't feel that way, but you do. And if you don't go on that date with that really hot person that you know is bad for you, you're not going to die either. It just feels like you're going to die, right? So all of these are driving everything we've ever done that we're ashamed of. And the benefits of fasting are teaching yourself that it's safe to go without. What I discovered and what is is there in Fast This Way is I had been taught as a young obese person, if you don't eat six meals a day, you'll go into starvation mode, which is death, okay? And I believe that because that's what all the health experts said, uh, which is nuts. And I also knew that when I was hungry, I would get hypoglybitchy. Like I would yell at the people I liked. I would just get angry and shaky and I would not act in a way that I respected. 
So I was afraid of being a jerk and I was afraid of being hungry. And at the same time, I realized from other personal development stuff, I was afraid of being alone. So I hired a shaman and said, I want you to drop me off in a cave with no humans and no food for four days. And I'm just going to have to deal with my issues. <laughs> and that isn't the way most people go about their work. But for me, it's like if I recognize that I have a trigger, I'm just going to hold the trigger down until I get done with it. And I've since developed other technologies to help remove triggers without having to just go feel the pain for four days. But I write about that experience both biologically, but psychologically, emotionally, and spiritually. Because fasting has always been paired with spiritual practices throughout all of history. And the reason it's been paired is that when you fast for two days, you go into ketosis. And when you have those ketones, the same ones that come from MCT oil, when you have those ketones present in your brain, you have more energy in the neurons than you normally do. And that provides you the extra energy to go within and do the awareness work. So what you get as a person of any age who decides you're going to start any form of fasting, and there's many fasting for things that aren't food, um, in fast this way, you get a sense of peace and a sense of power because what you thought was going to kill you loses its power. And you can sit there and say, you know, I'm perfectly fine sitting at this dinner with a bunch of people eating whatever they're going to eat with nothing on my plate. And I'm okay. Right now, they might lose it. I, I've witnessed that lots of times. People are like, you're going to die. Are you okay? Do you have an eating disorder? What's going on? You're like, no, I'm just fasting now. Like, I'm going to eat tomorrow. Right? But it just blows people's minds. But the other, that fear thing, man, it drives so much because right now when we're hungry, it we trigger fear. So all of a sudden we went from our normal hunger, which is five times more attention than it deserves. Now we've got 10 times more attention because we're afraid of being hungry. And fasting removes that 10x trigger because you're no longer afraid of being hungry. You're like, oh, hunger means I guess I should eat in the next while, but if I don't eat, I'll be okay. So then there's a sense of calm and a sense of peace whether or not you've got food. And when you turn down that 10X trigger and you turn down that 5X trigger, what you end up with is abundant extra capacity in your brain to do what you're actually here to do. And what you're here to do is the fourth F word that I haven't mentioned yet. All life does this. The fourth F word is friend. Every species on the planet cooperates with other species or with itself. That's why we have kombucha. That's why we have yogurt. That's why we have forests. That's why we have herds of deer. And that's why we have tribes of people and why we specialize, why we support our community, why we take care of our elders, why we take care of our children, why we are wired to help each other. Now, if we're in fear mode and hunger mode, it's a lot harder to focus on that fourth F word because it basically gets about a one or a 1.5 X attention. It's very hard to focus on that when we're afraid. So what's going on here is not that we've chosen this priority. It's that it is wired into the inner parts of every cell in your body and that they act based on the limited information that's available in your elbow or your liver or your eyeball. And it all rolls up and eventually it makes it through our nervous system to our prefrontal cortex, the, the part of our brain responsible for logic. And there, there's seven layers of filters that strip out all kinds of stuff that we never get to see. And we get to see the teeny tiny tip of what's left. But when you do this thing that's in the definition of biohacking, when, when I created the field of it, the definition is the art and science of changing the environment around you and inside of you so that you have full control of your own biology. What I'm proposing here is that by intermittent fasting, you're changing the environment inside of you biologically, which gives you more energy, which allows you to change the environment inside of you from your software perspective, from your thoughts and your feelings, and to sort out hunger versus anger versus fear and to get on top of those. And I promise you, for someone who's listening to this, who's 20 years old, you master this, Yes, you have more energy now. Yes, you grew abs. Yes, you like your life better. But the other benefit there is you actually own your stuff more quickly and with less work than it would be if you just kept eating whatever you're going to eat six times a day. I guess the question I have, I want to come back to what we talked about early on, having the Bulletproof Coffee as a way to kind of ease into an intermittent fast. You talked about the benefits you get doing that. But you also talked about what a purist fast would be, which is just having water. So are there differences in benefits going from a purist fast and, you know, dealing with the pain other than the psychological, you're naturally going to have psychological pain to deal with and push through and work through, which is going to help you grow. 
not having doing a purist fast versus you know not having that pain and that that craving other than that is there any physiological differences in the benefits you get when you include the bulletproof coffee versus just going straight on water there are a few and this is a matter of great debate so a lot of the studies on fasting involve mice mice don't have espresso machines they get water so they say, we prove that a water only fast does this. Therefore, you should water only fast. And the people who take that approach, I, I kind of call them the, the hair shirt fasters. You know what a hair shirt is? No. There's a weird sect of uh, Catholicism sometime 500 years ago. Monks would weave shirts out of human hair because it was extra itchy. And they would wear these itchy shirts all day long because they were bad and they had to suffer and remind themselves of how sinful they were. And then they would self-flagellate, they'd whip themselves on their back, just like, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to suffer here. It is acceptable to choose the hard path. However, if you're not in a place to do a spiritual fast where you want to do the hard fast, to force yourself to do the hard path when you had other things to show up for, like your family and your career and the world around you, I think it's doing disservice to yourself. So a lot of the water fasting stuff is like, well, that's what the mice did. So I'm just going to do it. I, I just interviewed someone on, on Bulletproof Radio who for 30 years has been leading people through water only fasts, medically supervised without even salt, but they do you know two lab tests a day to make sure your electrolytes are right. And I asked him, well, why water only? Like, why wouldn't you take the stuff that would reduce the, you know, the oozing stuff that comes out of people's skin when you do that. He goes, well, we don't know what it'll do. So we just do it with what we know works. Now, as a biohacker, I'm like, look, I'm going to choose to suffer less and get the results. So if you do a water only fast, my recommendation and those of many people out there is at least have some electrolytes. There's great electrolyte formulas out there. Um, there's this element stuff. You can just do a pinch of sea salt. You can take potassium. And I talk about different minerals you might want to take during a fast. And these are for shorter fasts. I mean, if you're going to do a very long fast, you want to medically monitor it. So if you do only water, um, that flies in the face of what just about every spiritual tradition ever has done. They always drink at least herbal tea or regular tea during a fast because it seems to make it work better. And the reason for that is the polyphenols, the colored compounds in colored plants, they feed the good guy bacteria called bacteriodetes. People who are thin have more of those and less firmicutes, which is another species more abundant in fat people. So since you're not feeding the firmicutes, if you feed some polyphenols to these things, they actually like it and you get more of the good guys. So there's a benefit to that. But on a water-only fast, it may allow the gut to rest more. People who are doing a microbiome reset where they want to basically kill off most of the stuff in their gut to allow something else to emerge. These are people with cancer and diabetes and people who are going to do a, a long-term water fast. Um, there, you wouldn't want to have the prebiotic fiber, for instance, because you want nothing to grow. You're, you're kind of you know, just saying, we're going to go down to almost no gut bacteria and then we're going to reestablish flora. So that's an interesting perspective on it. But in terms of the benefits of doing a water-only intermittent fast versus having coffee, the coffee is going to give you better results. <laughs> You'll actually have a more successful fast with more fat burning, less hunger, more of everything. Now, if you want to go for the bulletproof coffee, what you'll find is that it makes it very easy to work your way into fasting because it teaches the body, oh, there's going to be ketones present, therefore you should re-architect yourself to burn fat. There are a few people out there who will just stand up and say, oh, it's not really fasting because it has calories. The thing that matters though is, is there carbohydrate metabolism? No. Is there protein metabolism? No. Those are the things that break a fast. So might you lose weight faster on a water only fast? We don't have great evidence either way. You might, however, you might not because your body doesn't go into fat burning mode as quickly. So I have just after 10 years of this and with millions of people trying Bulletproof, I'll tell you that it works. I cannot tell you that it works better than water-only fasting, but I can tell you that you suffer less and that you will very soon learn when you make your Bulletproof coffee. I actually don't, I only need like a teaspoon of MCT. It's like, I've got it this morning. I, I just don't want it. And someone is like, I'm just going to have coffee, right? Almost no one listening is going to say, oh, I actually today just don't want coffee. 90% of people drink coffee. <laughs> coffee is just a well-established superfood. And there are people who say, 
oh, but coffee's addictive. I don't want to be addicted to anything. I'm like, do you exercise every day? And they go, yeah, go, great. What happens if you don't exercise for three days? And they say, I don't feel as good. I'm like, then you're addicted to exercise. You should stop. So <laughs> that's my take on coffee during fasting. You probably want to do it or tea at a minimum. Well, let's come back to your story with the shaman and the vision quest. Let's go back to 2008. You brought that up quickly, but this is a time when you did a water only fast. So let's come back to that time and talk about where you were at in your life and what made you want to do this. Well, I had been through, um, I I'd stayed in a, in a bad relationship for a lot longer uh, than I should have. I had made and lost $6 million. Uh, I had struggled uh, with my weight for years and tested every diet out there and, and really already gotten deep on the biology. I had been diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia. I had high risk of stroke and heart attack on labs before I was 30. Uh, I had arthritis since I was 14. So my biology wasn't working that well. But I was pretty pissed off all the time too. <laughs> so I was like, I've, I've got some work to do here. And as an engineer, I'm like, why do I make choices that are clearly stupid? Like there has to be something else going on in there. So I did all the stuff that's supposed to work. And then I'm like, okay, I didn't lose the weight. You know, I'm not happy. I tried fame. I was 22, 23. I sold the first thing ever sold over the internet before it was even called e-commerce. I had my picture in Entrepreneur Magazine. I'm, you know, double extra large t-shirt, you know, red pimply face, the whole nine yards. And that was, uh, that didn't make me happy to be well known for a brief period. And then I made a bunch of money when I was 26. And I looked at a friend at this company. You know, we held Google's first servers when it was you know, two guys and two computers. And this was a company that became worth $36 billion. And I was a co-founder of a, a part of the company. And I looked at my friend and said, I'll be happy when I have 10 million, when I had $6 million at 26. Okay, that is the biggest douchebag comment I think I've ever made, although I've made many. And, but I felt it was real at the time. And many people at the company did too. And I'm like, wait a minute. If I can't be happy with $6 million, fame isn't going to make me happy. Money isn't going to make me happy. Right? So why am I not happy here? And I started working on that. And that was a much harder thing. And that led me to um, South America, to Peru. I did ayahuasca with a shaman. Before, uh, before ayahuasca was even well known, I went down there and, and they're like, you want to do what? I said, no, that, that's for local people. Like, Dave, you're white. You'll throw up. You won't like it. You shouldn't do this. And uh and I did it anyway. And, and I went on this path of like understanding why I would do the things I would do that I didn't choose to do uh, because I kind of thought I was a meat robot. And my path has been discovering, wow, there's a lot going on below the neck here. And some of it is biological, in fact, more than we think. But a lot of it is also the software. It's our belief systems. It's our patterns where, oh, if this pattern happens in our life, it triggers this emotion because our body determined without our permission that something was happening that wasn't real. and. That was what led me to that awareness. And I said, all right, I know I've got this fear of being alone. And I know that the idea of being hungry brings me anxiety because I don't want to be a jerk anymore. And because I don't, I don't want to go into starvation mode. I don't want to be even fatter. Like I've, I've struggled for years with not being fatter. You know, every time you, you kind of hang your head and go, I'm going to have to get out my fat pants again. I wonder what I did wrong. You know, it's so disheartening. And I just, I wanted to get on top of, of those emotions because I realized the emotions were driving me more than I thought. And by putting myself in a situation that I couldn't escape, um, that really, um, that was really pushing my buttons. I remember I had a protein bar and I, I was like, I'm just going to have this just in case I need it. And I had it in my backpack. And right before I, I went out there, I was like, no, and I just left it on the kitchen table at the, with the shaman. I know very well I would have eaten that thing if I had it. <laughs> What were some of the most profound experiences you had during that four days? Man, you go through these things. I, I did experience really strong hunger on the second day, but I just realized how much fear was driving me. There was a, a time, you know, in the middle of the night, I, I heard this, this you know, rustling and I, I'm in a cave. Uh, the cave is called First Woman. It's shaped like a giant vagina and the local indigenous people, for them, that's where Adam and Eve first emerged onto the planet. So this is a place that's been used uh, for ceremony for 10,000 years and you know there's blackened walls with suit on them and and uh, so I asked for permission to to be there and it was uh, it was strange because having grown up in the desert I know about predators I know about rattlesnakes and you know things like that so I 
I put a bunch of brush at the entrance to the cave. So if something larger wants to come in, and this is a way all humans have protected themselves as like an alarm system. So I wake up in the middle of the night going, oh my God, like there's something rustling in there, like, like kind of losing. I get on my flashlight and I can't see anything. And like, you know, heart's pounding and I can't go back to sleep. And I'm just like worrying, worrying, worrying. And the next night, same thing. I'm kind of freaking out. And finally, I figure it out. Because I put the brush out there, a bird, a nocturnal bird had started nesting in the brush and it was making noise. And I'm like, wait a minute, I lost my, you know what, uh, twice over a little tiny bird. And it was such a metaphor for I'm losing my mind over hunger. I'm losing my mind over all these other things I believe to be true that have no basis in reality. So this is called a spiritual fast. And what I'm doing in fast this way is I'm bringing spirituality back into the practice of fasting. And what I decided for the the first time is that I've, I, I've put thousands of hours into writing a book because like if, you know, half a million people are going to read a book and they're all going to use 10 hours to read it, that's half a million times, to whatever that that's 5 million hours. I don't know how many life human lifetimes is, but that's a lot. So if I write a book that wasn't worth their time, I'm kind of a mass murderer. So I, I really care about that. But then I realized I was a teacher for five years at the University of California, but I wasn't teaching the books. So I'd, I'd write the textbook, but there wasn't like the course to go with it. So people who buy the book, you send me a receipt at fast this way. And I'm teaching the book for two weeks and I'm leading people through the fast with hacks. We're going to do a fast without them. But the final two days is actually a spiritual fast where you can fast for just the morning, or you can do a 24 hour or a 48 hour fast if you want to, but along the way to do the personal development work that comes with actually sitting with your hunger and actually feeling what's going on and, and going within, but going within when you have less noise from digestion and more energy from having ketones. And when you do that, that's when the real awareness happens. Like what is my relationship with hunger? And that's different than my relationship with food. Maybe you eat because you're bored. Maybe you eat because you're lonely. I actually did both. <laughs> um, you know, maybe there's no emotional component. It's just because you have these intense cravings because you're eating the wrong foods that cause cravings. But you become aware of that and you also become aware of, you know, you feel more grounded, you feel more connected with the world around you. And those are things that are very precious around fasting. I just promise you that if you're intermittent fasting on Monday morning and you have a job, that's not where you're going Monday morning, but you still want the fast. So it's, there's two flavors of fasting and they're both important. I want to come back to the cave and you talked about ayahuasca and having that experience beforehand. I don't know how many years before. That was probably five or six years. Yeah. Okay. That would have, I'm assuming, been a profoundly spiritual experience. Along with doing the water fast for four days, that being a profoundly spiritual experience. So can you kind of compare compare and contrast the two of them and, and talk about some similarities and differences? There are many, many different ways to reach altered states. And you've read my book, Game Changers, where I've interviewed you know, 500 people who've done big things in the world. What do you guys all agree on? One of the, the laws that I'm like, what if I study meta gurus? You know, I don't want to follow one guru. I want to find what they all agree on and I'll do that because I'm lazy. And one of the rules was get out of your head, right? And fasting is a tried and true way, especially on a longer fast for longer than usually 36 hours or so. You start just kind of getting a little bit floaty, right? That's one way to do it, but it's relatively gentle unless you're going to do a long fast. Um, then you really start, if you're meditating and fasting, like during a, a fasting vipassana or some of the practices in caves and all, you can go to very deep places. Ayahuasca, it kind of kicks you there <laughs> really quickly. Uh, and it's a different place than you go from a spiritual fast. Um, you're, you know, you're using a different agent. You're activating DMT in the brain, which gets activated when you're born and when you die. And so you definitely see stuff that you aren't going to see except during a very intense fast. Um, I've also done a lot of holotropic breathing, and I've written about that in some of my books. Um, some of the places I'll go during the 40 Years of Zen advanced neurofeedback training that I do. Um, I have seen more you know, intense spiritual stuff from neurofeedback and holotropic breathing than I did from ayahuasca or fasting. But they're all in that that same quadrant of the map around spiritual practices where you develop awareness of yourself and you probably see stuff that you can't rationally uh, account for. And if you are rational about it, you just realize the universe is way more interesting than you believed it to be. 
And this is where a lot of cutting edge neuroscience is going. Uh, and certainly where I'm going with my neuroscience company is that studying human consciousness has been the hardest thing to do because we're immersed in our own consciousness. But any of those practices, whether it's you know rapid holotropic breathing or other breathing practices, um, fasting, plant medicines, uh, even things like certain drumming circles, all of those can take you to a place that is abnormal. Because frankly, normal means average. And if you wanna be a high performing human being, you better be willing to go to a place that's not average. So experiencing different abnormal states, as long as they're not permanently harmful abnormal states, is good. Likewise, try taking an ice bath. <laughs> You'll go to some crazy places sitting in an ice bath for the first time, getting a strong signal from your body that says, I am going to die. And you going, shut up, you can do three minutes or 20 minutes, or whatever it is. And that, that argument, that wrestling between your conscious, adult, human, rational mind and the animal, emotional, spiritual side of you that says one thing is true and you saying another thing is true. The reality is usually somewhere in the middle. And so my practice of fasting in a cave, my practice of plant medicine, my practice of neurofeedback and breathing and all of the things that I've done, and I'm very blessed to, to be friends with some of the leaders in personal development, um, all of those just serve to say there's different layers of awareness that you can have. And that being able to tap into those makes you a better human being, but denying their existence based on the idea that you've been taught they can't exist, that doesn't seem to serve you very well uh, because the, the type of creation that I do in the world, you know, changing the language around health, like how many times you would hack your health or upgrade your biology, I did that, right? We really have changed the, the the level of control that we all believe that we have over ourselves, that it's now okay to assert control over your body. Whereas before, it was sort of like you just wanted to be thin, but but it was more like you were a victim of the food. And so we, we now are way more in charge of ourselves. That kind of stuff, that's a personal development practice, right? And now the challenge is you could meditate for two hours a day for the rest of your life. I just don't have two hours a day. I have companies to run. I have kids to be with. I have a wife. I have friends. I have a community. I have a farm. I, <laughs> maybe instead of meditating, I could feed the sheep, right? So all of those things, how do you get the progress in the least amount of energy and time required to continue growing as a human? I am 100% certain, and why I wrote this book is that when you take up regular intermittent fasting without a spiritual practice, you will have a quantum jump in the amount of energy available to you for your brain. And you will be, you'll have enough energy to be curious and enough energy to explore the boundaries of what you find are true. And this is why fasting is so important. It's the power that you get. And you will just, as a natural human being, you're curious. We all want to come to this next level. And this ties back to Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. A lot of people have heard of this. And that, oh, we need food and shelter and safety and love and things like that. What almost no one knows, and what I didn't know, is that right before he died, he died at 62, is Abraham Maslow um, had written up the final step of the hierarchy of human needs. It was for transcendence, <laughs> to be connected to the world around you. And the guy who discovered this in his writings is named Scott Barry Kaufman, who was a guest on Bulletproof Radio. I think he's at Columbia, uh, one of the big universities. and. Um, I believe that this is just part of it. We just don't have the power to get to the next level if we eat all the time or if we eat the wrong stuff all the time. And that's why intermittent fasting matters because it will give you the power to choose your path to become a better, more evolved human being. It's that big of a deal. And that's why it's worth a book. And that's why it's worth the time it takes to read it. This is not a book that says step one, don't eat. Step two, it's good for you. We know these to be true. How do you do it? How do you do it in a busy life? And when you choose to use it as a spiritual practice, how do you do that? And it's just a different thought process than, oh, just do something that's good for you. Like you can tell people to exercise every day, it's good for them. A, it probably isn't if it's heavy exercise. And B, only 8% of people will do it anyway because it's not pleasant. I want to make intermittent fasting more pleasant than having breakfast. And I think I've done it. Let's come full circle on the cave story. You leave the cave after four days, you're by yourself, you only have water, What's it like coming back into society after that point? And how are you a different person? Well, the first thing that happens, I was lit up with energy, like crazy levels of energy. And during this fast, I had a cell phone. This was before smartphones were a thing. 
Um, you know, there was no Instagram. Uh, and so what I would do is every morning I would turn on my phone for a minute and text the shaman and say, I'm okay. And she'd text back if there was anything that I needed, you know, to do, or like if something weird had happened, um, like, you know, there's a nuclear war or something, I have to come pick you up. Um, so I usually didn't receive anything, but she, uh, she said, okay, I'll come pick you up and I'm going to pick up another person who's fasting in a different cave somewhere. Uh, and I said, oh, don't worry. I can just walk. And it's, I, it's several miles, the other cave. I'm like, I can just walk. And she's like, I don't think you should. I'm like, no, I'm, I'm ready. And I was just like, like just a ball of energy. So I had a canteen full of water and I put on my backpack. It's not that heavy. There's no food in there. <laughs> There's just a backpack uh, and a jacket. And I start walking. Okay. Now I thought I knew which mountain I was heading for. I was wrong. So I'm like, there's weird, there's no trail up here. I just can't find this. So I climb to the top of a mountain and I get there and there's no cave there where I thought there would be. I'm like, oh man, this isn't good. And my phone's almost out of battery. So I'm, you know, I, I'm sort of texting going, where are you guys? And she's like, great. Now you're lost in the desert. You know, this is fantastic. So I ended up, oh, I think I can see a road over there. So I just cross country through the desert, you know, rattlesnakes and whatever else, cactus. And um, zero lack of energy, zero fear, uh, even zero dehydration. I still had water left and I was, I haven't grown up in the desert. I'm like, you know, at a certain point you run out of water in the desert, it's going to suck, but I'm just, I'm, I have just, I have so much energy. It was hard to explain. Okay. How is it that I can walk like 10 miles in the heat without any food for four days? Like I was blowing myself out of the water. Right. And then come back and you know have some sort of a meal i don't think i even remember how i broke the fast it was probably some sort of a juice thing or something i uh, just have no recollection uh, and then you know the next day it's you know drive to the airport and start to go back but it does take a couple days um where you're just like wow i i i remember the feeling of energy and power um, that i had you know, remember the sort of the spiritual experiences Anytime you do intense personal development, whether it's ayahuasca, whether it's like the neurofeedback path, that is my favorite, whether it's even a heavy duty holotropic experience, it usually takes two to four days to ground yourself back in reality. Like I remember one time as I was developing the 40 years of Zen uh, work, I had spent seven days doing really intense, deep neurofeedback work. I went to all these crazy spiritual places and I started a new job the next day. So I come into work and I'm like only halfway in reality. And one of the uh, the people I was starting to work with, she comes up, she goes, do you meditate? And I go, actually, yeah, I do. Why? She goes, you have this look in your eyes like my guru from India. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, like what do my eyes look like? <laughs> like, I'm not trying to do that. I don't want to be a guru. But I was just like so altered. It, it like took my brain a couple days. And I felt similar to that after fasting. And like, it's okay if you're going to go to somewhere strange and that's not what you normally do, it's okay to adjust when you come back. But what I did find when I came back is that that feeling of I'm going to die if I don't eat, it was gone because I realized I, I showed my cells that they weren't going to die if they didn't eat. And I'd lost crazy amounts of weight uh, when I was doing that, which wasn't my intent at all. It just naturally happened. But my metabolism worked better. Like my eyes were brighter. Uh, and it was, it was really good. It was, it was good for my relationship at home too. You know, I had a, about a one-year-old, um, during that time. And it was, uh, uh, it was, it was just a generally good thing. I, I think everything in my life got better after that. Well, speaking of kids, when it comes to fasting, can kids ever fast? And if they can, at what age would, would you say it's safe? Younger children shouldn't fast, but you shouldn't force them to eat either. So they are very self-guided. I learned as a parent that every time my kids said, I don't want that food, they were right. Now, it's different if your kids say, I only want to eat the french fries. But if I'd serve them the foods that they liked, you know, here's a, some grass-fed steak, here's some broccoli. I'm like, I don't want the broccoli tonight, daddy. And if I'd say, shut up and eat your broccoli, I'm like, oh, that's funny. All of us felt like crap the next morning because that broccoli actually wasn't good. It had, you know, it's called um, alternarium brassica. It's the type of mold that grows on brassica family. And all of us slept poorly and like didn't feel good. And the kids were cranky. And we all wanted dessert, which means we, oh, we ate a food toxin. They knew. And so kids have a really good self-guidance that also can be like candy, candy, candy. But if you teach your kids not to eat candy, and you teach your kids they don't get to pick what the food is, and you put out food that they normally eat and they don't want to eat it, like, okay, that's fine. My daughter is 13. She's like, Daddy, I really don't like having breakfast. Like, I just don't, like, when I'm home, I don't want to have, I don't want to eat anything. 
until noon. And I'm like, that's great. You don't have to, right? But if she did when she was six, I'd say, let's wait a couple hours and you can have something. But because we are wired as parents to feel as if our children are us, our energy field is actually extended out and our children are a part of our energy field. It's stronger for, for mothers, but it's also there for dads and we're holding them in our energy, right? So when we feel like our children might be starving, what was that about the survival of the species? Okay, <laughs> that's in there. And every parent on earth will take their last bite of food and give it to their kid if it's actual starvation. So when we feel our children might be starving, we do what the stereotypical parents do. Oh, here, eat, eat, eat. And it sets our children up for failure. So what I do in my house is, hey guys, um, this is, I guess when they were younger, they don't do it anymore. But you know, my son's like, daddy, I'm not going to eat this. I just don't want to eat this tonight. And it was whatever the broccoli was or whatever. And this wasn't a case of the broccoli was good. It was just, you know, asserting control. Uh, and I said, oh, that's awesome, Alan. You've decided to join me in an intermittent fast. We won't starve to death for about 60 days. So we can just put the food back in the fridge and we both won't eat. And then he looks at me and, he, and then he eats his dinner. <laughs> Right? So that you're not going to starve if you don't get the candy is a big thing. Also, don't feed your kids candy anyway. But should you force a kid to fast? Never. If a child's curious about fasting, I think it's fine for them to do it. And I relay the story in the book. My son was probably nine at the time. Um, he's 11 now, maybe even eight. But you know, we've been talking about fasting a lot. And I said, oh, I'm going to fast for a couple of days. And he'd seen me do it a few times. And he said, Daddy, I've decided I want to try fasting for 24 hours. And I said, really? Okay. You know, you're not allowed to fast regularly because you're too young for that. You want your body to know that we live in a land of abundance and that it's safe to grow and, you know, become as strong as it possibly can be because there's no limitation on resources. Um, but yeah, you can fast. And I said, you might want to have a little bit of black coffee. My kids drink coffee. They always have because coffee is good for you and kids metabolize caffeine quite well. They just, you know, they, have, they get half a cup in the morning. That's fine. And so you might want to have some coffee because it'll it'll make it so you're less hungry. And he goes, no, I actually want to feel the fast so that I know what it's like. So I don't want to try any of the fasting hacks. I'm just going to, uh, I'm just going to do it. And he did it. And, you know, it was a great act of willpower for him, but he was showing himself who was in charge. And it was amazing. And when he finally broke his fast, he goes, daddy, you're right. Fasting really is the best spice. This is the best meal I've ever had. And since then, he hasn't wanted to fast. Every now and they'll say, I don't want breakfast. That's fine, right? So we don't force them to eat, but we don't encourage them to fast. We don't allow them to fast. The same is true for teenagers. Look, if a teenager wants to intermittent fast several times a week, that's fine. But you need to have a protein breakfast the other days. If you're working out that day, you know, if they're in track or whatever, then they eat a protein and fat breakfast. And they're not allowed to go out and exercise a lot because a lot of teenagers, especially girls, um, they'll get to that like, oh, you know, I'm just not going to eat very much. I'm going to do all the things I do. And they're not, they don't have the wiring to be aware of their state to realize, oh, I'm acting the way I'm acting and I can't focus because I either don't have the right nutrients or because I'm not eating enough. So I think it's important that um, you don't uh, in, over encourage that. And that my kids, if they want to intermittent fast every day, I'd say no. But if they want intermittent fast three, four days a week, fine. But my kids are now 11 and 13 and they're getting to that point. And when they were younger, no way. You guys eat um, you guys eat lunch and dinner and usually breakfast. The other thing about kids, they do not need to eat six times a day. They might need to eat four times a day. They might need to eat three times a day. And my daughter came home from first or second grade and she said, Dave, or not Dave, she said, Daddy, as soon as I get to school, the teachers start talking about our snack and we get there and then all the other kids are hungry, but I don't even want to eat. Don't the other kids have breakfast? And I said, well, Anna, go ask them what they have for breakfast. And she comes back, she says, oh, my, my vegan friend has a green apple for breakfast. I'm like, Anna, if you had a green apple, would you be hungry? And she goes, yes. And I said, well, there you go. They're eating the wrong breakfast. So then they feel like they need to eat two hours later. And she says, I wish the teacher wouldn't make me eat a snack because I really don't want the snack. I'm full until lunch. So she would like fake eating a snack that she didn't want. Okay. This is what happens. You feed children enough of the right fats and the right protein. What's she having for breakfast? Smoked salmon from Costco, wild caught smoked salmon, which is good, and avocados, right? Or bacon and eggs, right? Or other things like that that are rich in fat and rich in protein. And then they're, they're satiated. And as a parent, 
what this does for you, Jesse, you get enough interruptions from children because they don't have filters. If the interruption is, can I have candy? Can I have candy? Can I have candy? I'm hungry, 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 hungry. Man, it's exhausting for parents. It's exhausting for kids. And when you feed them right, they don't do that. So it's more about the right food and permission to skip a meal, but not regularly skipping a meal. Long answer, but I think it's a a really important nuance for parents. Definitely important. And earlier, Dave, you quickly touched on differences when it comes to fasting between men and women. Is there any further depth you want to go into on that and and special considerations? when? Because I know you talk about in the book how a lot of the research is actually done on men. So with your experience, what have you found can help women along the way? Well, only about 25 to 35% of studies of fasting even account for women. And the reason for this is that throughout most of medical research, the cheapest human guinea pigs are college freshmen and college freshmen were predominantly white dudes. <laughs> now it's shifted. There's actually more women in college than men. Uh, but because we'd experiment on them, you pay them 10 bucks and they'll do anything you want. <laughs> so they would run these crazy things on men. And the research on women definitely shows that they are less resilient to fasting than men, but that it's profoundly good for them. And this goes, in fact, there's a whole chapter in the book focusing just on the research for women and the hormone changes. And one of the biggest things for women is when you're right in the middle of your cycle, you're menstruating, you already have a biological stressor right now. Your body is working on rebuilding tissues. You are unlikely to get the results from fasting on those days. Then being kind to yourself, having protein, having fat, having some carbohydrates later in the day, which is going to give you the energy and the building blocks your body needs to rebuild the lining of your uterus. And if instead you're saying, I'm just going to fast, well, why does it not work now, but it worked other times? It's because women have times of the month when they're highly focused and high performance, and they have times of the month where they're less performant. And Olympic athletes I've interviewed on the show talk about this. I was saying, oh, I know that if I have a competition during my cycle, I'm less likely to win because my body's busy on doing other stuff, right? So the same goes for fasting. So fasting during menstruation is usually not a good idea, even the day after, uh, or if you're going to do it, a shorter intermittent fast, or ideally doing it with bulletproof coffee. So at least you've got the ketones in the body. You've got some building blocks. You've taken a load off, but you're still allowing the protein digestion and repair systems to work. Uh, so that that's the biggest thing for women. And also just don't overfast. Guys can fast more than women uh, and get away with it and actually benefit from it. And so for women, um, especially if you have weight to lose, start out three or four days a week doing intermittent fasting and start out with the fasting hacks. And over time, as your body becomes stronger and leaner and your mitochondria become better at burning fat, you might say, oh, I'm going to do it five days a week, but it's okay to have breakfast like you do on weekends. Breakfast does not mean the Denny's Grand Slam with all the bad fats and all that. And way back in the day when I was fat, I'd be super clean during the week, but I knew we had to have a a cheat meal every day. And um, Tim Ferriss, who I respect a lot, has been on my show a few times, you know, in the four-hour body, he talks about kind of having a cheat day. What I found over many cheat days as a younger person was that the cravings and the inflammation that those would induce, that they lasted for several days and cause way more suffering than it was worth. So now the cheat day might be, I eat a lot more carbs, right? But these are carbs that are not going to leave a residue of inflammation. I don't eat bad fats. I don't eat you know chicken McNuggets on a cheat day. That would be ridiculous. So you still keep it clean, but you're having a lot more carbs and it's very enjoyable, delicious food. And that's an important thing uh, for women, even more important than men. You know, when, when you do, uh, uh, when you're not fasting, it's okay to have carbs. If you want to be in keto, do it for a week or two and then go out, allow the parts of your body that need carbs to do it, reduce the biological stress, and then go back in. It's the cycles <laughs> instead of just like, I'm going to push and never stop pushing. So that that's the biggest finding in the chapter for women. Great. Important we covered that too. And Dave, I know you got to go, but I want to cover one last thing before, before we hang up here. And that is somebody who is, say, starting out, you know, they're still relatively new into this. They're doing the bulletproof coffee in the morning, skipping breakfast, but they're ready for the next step. What are some of the supplements or adjuncts somebody can incorporate after, you know, they get going on this a little bit and they're ready, ready to evolve a little bit? You know, some people are still stuck in that water only fasting and they say, 
you shouldn't take any supplements during a fast. But that doesn't make sense because you're fasting for a reason. And if you have supplements that can give you the results you want better than fasting alone, I think we kind of have an obligation to do that. One of the really magic supplements during fasting that you read about in Fast This Way is activated charcoal. It's been used for thousands of years for detoxing any kind of GI thing. One of the reasons that you feel really um, uncomfortable when you first start fasting is that the gut bacteria have nothing to eat. Now, remember those four F words? You run away from kill or hide from scary things. You're a gut bacteria. You can't run away. You can't hide. So you start making something called lipopolysaccharide. This is your chemical defense system that says, I'm stressed, there's not enough food, I'm gonna kill everything around me so I can get the food. <laughs> and that compound, LPS, is well known to induce inflammation even in the brain. It crosses the blood-brain barrier, it crosses the gut barrier easily. Well, if you take activated charcoal, it absorbs all the LPS so it doesn't go into your body. So you can take that during a fast, it has no calories, but it absorbs the gut toxins. And it really reduces cravings and makes you feel better. Another one of the supplements that I write about that's, I think, really powerful during a fast is proteolytic enzymes. And I talk about a few different formulas in the book. But one of the more commonly known ones is serapeptase, which is the enzyme that silkworms use to break down silk. And when you take serapeptase, it actually increases the enzyme capacity of the body to break down scar tissue and other things during the process of autophagy. So you can take one, or for me, I, I take about 10 of the very high strength one. This is a very mega dose of that, but I do that actually every night when I'm fasting and I have for a long time because the benefits over time of keeping immune molecules down in the body, keeping scar tissue down, removing adhesions in the body, it, it's very powerful over time, but during a fast, it's even more powerful. So those are two of the, the basic examples, but there's a list of safe supplements and a list of supplements I call the Barfi 4 that you ought not to take during a fast unless you want to taste them again. Coming back to LPS really quick, is this something the bacteria over time are going to produce less of if you're into fasting regularly, or is charcoal something that you're probably going to need to incorporate long term? The studies that I wrote about in Superhuman show that charcoal actually in, uh, lengthens lifespan in animals by about 15%. It reduces cardiovascular risk over time. So charcoal is something that you take away from medication and away from other vitamins, um, but it has uh, very powerful long-term effects. So I think it's one of those very cheap, very beneficial supplements that you might want to take regularly. As you fix your gut bacteria, especially if you're using the prebiotic fiber fasting hack that I talk about, um, you will change the ratio of good guys to bad guys. So you'll make less LPS just from having a healthy gut biome. You can do that without fasting, but fasting with prebiotic fiber, well, you didn't feed anything to the bad guys and you fed stuff to the good guys. So you'll more rapidly shift the balance of bacteria in the gut and you'll gain more beneficial species by just having the right substrate for them to grow on. So ideally, you'll make less LPS. But if you have really bad gas uh, and you have lots of GI issues the way I used to, um, then you'll find you have more lipopolysaccharide. Therefore, you have more inflammation throughout the body. And you do want to manage that in all the ways we talk about. All right, Dave. Thank you so much for your time. Like I said at the beginning, fastest way. Loved the book. My favorite book of yours I've, writ I've read to this point. Um, other than listeners getting a copy, how can they connect with you? Well, get a copy and send your receipt uh, through the website, fastthisway.com. I'm going to be leading more than 10,000 people in a community through two weeks of me teaching you what's in the book for free. I just want to do this because if I'm going to spend thousands of hours writing the book and I don't follow through and teach it, uh, I feel like I'm not... Uh, you know, I'm not following through on on my belief in how powerful this is. So I would be honored to be able to teach people this and lead them through. Something else with fasting we didn't talk much about is doing it in community, whether it's with family or friends, makes it a lot easier and more fun. So having 10,000 people sharing their experience at the same time is going to be really powerful. And this is just me wanting to share. It's fastthisway.com. Just send in your receipt. I'll get you enrolled. And the fasting challenge starts a couple of days after the book comes out on the 19th comes back to the fourth F again, friend. And uh, yeah, that, that sounds like a great thing. And I'm sure you're going to have a great response from all your, your audience. And I'm excited for you. And Dave, I thank you so much for coming back on the show. Always a pleasure and wishing you all the best. Thank you, Jesse. Appreciate the interview. Thank you.